We have already applied a very thick layer of ontological discourse, how to discuss the limits of the human. So I'm very grateful also to Dimitri especially, who really arranged this session today, and also for having screened already this very interesting interaction between music and slime mold. Because I remember in 2004, when all was still about artificial intelligence and the weak artificial life discourse in art, I gave a response to Eduardo Miranda in a conference, and he was complaining that it was so difficult to actually mimic, to program randomness in his artificial life systems. And I said, why do you just do not hook up with a natural organism? Because in nature, the noise is for free, right? So it's funny to see the outcomes 10 years later. And the discourse has totally shifted from soft and hardware towards wet work, which Richard also mentioned this morning. So also, however, we are in an art space, and I want to give a lot of art examples. But also we are in a period where the techno-scientific worldviews may have becoming dominant over the classical humanities when it comes to how we discuss this kind of fields in society. So when I'm showing images, I'm well aware of the risk that uh, the artistic artworks displayed as flat uh, images may also fall into the trap of very superficial hermeneutics. Um, I'm right now creating just now two projects which are trans species. One is a co-creation in Berlin, actually, for an artist that also uh, Dimitri has just shown, uh, Maya Smereka, is making a project about trans species motherhood while feeding a puppy with her own artificially produced breast milk. And I'm working on an exhibition on art and synthetic biology at UCI in Irvine, in California, where we just have this week over our Russian friends, which had a project here precisely at this space, uh, Dimitri Gelfand and Evelina Domnich. So we have chosen them for the first artist in residency program at UCI in California for art and synthetic biology. But in my contribution, I will now connect my curatorial and academic research into artistic practices that materially stage and manipulate biological systems and agents. A trend that I have been investigating over the last 15 years is biomediality. I want to ask whether such artistic practices can challenge anthropocentrism philosophically and politically by destabilizing the human scale as crucial reference point. And by replacing it by a transversal ecological view, can such art increase awareness for the invisibility of the microscopic and the incomprehensibility of the macroscopic? In addition, I see such techno-science-inspired art as a part of what I have previously referred to as an epistemological turn in art, when art itself becomes less concerned with aesthetic form, um, but is increasingly linked to techno-scientific critique and alternative knowledge production, focusing not only on what we know, but on how we know what we know, because features that once unfolded primarily as artistic images, as representations, are today being remediated, dispersed and fragmented in a multitude of technological, including biotechnological media. So in the art practice I will discuss, while shifting the focus from actions of a mesoscopic human body to functions of microscopic bodies, we witness a trend that I'm addressing here as microperformativity, a part of which can be molecular theater, uh, when gene or cell fragments, proteins, enzymes, but also viruses or bacteria employ to act as ontologized identity proxies. So in terms of performance art, which mainly involve mesoscopic human bodies, shifts more generally towards performativity in art, artists and performers redefine what we actually consider a body and subvert the mesoscopic tradition in which humans' phenomenological considerations are still rooted. So such descaling not only happens in relation to space, but also in relation to time. Staged diegetic theater time is being contrasted with real performative time of alternative agencies, and we in some cases can also talk of plantamorphizations and where microtransplantations of molecules hook up humankind with animals and plants agencies to emphasize the continuum of the living. And finally, microorganisms increasingly enter the focus of 
synthetic of inter artistic interest today. Bacteria are becoming big. It's a real interesting bacterial turn we can speak of um, between microbiome research and synthetic biology. Bacteria are rehabilitated and reconsidered in art, philosophy, and the natural health science, which is why we have created a new interdisciplinary research platform at the University of Copenhagen, and the label of which is Big Bacteria, not Big Data. Shifting the attention from the paradigm of Big Data to Big Bacteria, it calls for the cultural understanding of bodies in general as multidimensional beings and as cross-species ecologies. This is Jim's dog, found in a canyon that Donna Haraway takes as a departure in her book, When Species Meet. Quote, so many species, so many kinds meet in, the, in Jim's dog. It's composed by stump, mosses, fern, lichens, and bacteria. To be one is always to become with many Haraway rivals. Human genomes can be found only in 10% of all the cells that occupy the mundane space that I call my body. The other 90% of the cells are filled with genomes of bacteria, fungi, protists, and such, some of which play a symphony necessary to my very becoming, to my being alive at all. I'm vastly outnumbered by my tiny companions, beyond the mesoscopic individual dog. Since roughly two decades now, such tiny companions or alien agencies have progressively been employed by artists to upgrade the art historical desire to stage aliveness with biotechnological methods. So in the past, by the means of form, material, and process, a touch of aliveness was staged. Art has imagined, represented, mimicked, simulated, and quite recently manipulated living systems and beings for real. So after painting, sculpture, automata, etc., art in the 20th century has first implied dry informatics and robotics to stage aliveness, as well as since recently wet cell and molecular biology. So transgenic synthesis of DNA sequences, biobricks, molecular biologically visual imaging media such as gel electrophoresis or DNA chips, cell and tissue engineering, the use of retroviruses or the cloning of bacterial plasmid DNA belong to the repertoire of a still marginal but very experimental form of contemporary art, which is usually not gallery art. It has become a process-based art of transformation in vivo or in vitro that manipulates biological materials at discrete levels. Cells, proteins, genes could also be viruses or bacteria and creates displays that allow audiences to partake of them cognitively and emotionally. But it's difficult to come to grips with anthropomorphization. As an example, Rachel Armstrong's live bottom-up synthetic biology installation, Living Chemistry, stages the formation of protocells, precursors of living cells formed by innate complex chemistry of molecules and which share some of the physical chemical properties of living cells. It is indeed accompanied by a short film, A Natural History of Protocells, and here subtitles suggest emotional narratives. They stress the human desire to even see the smallest units of emerging life forms that created through the anthropomorphic lens. Different scales are indeed offering artistic potential within the organic realm of carbon-based living systems and in between the inanimate physical microscopic and macroscopic extremes from which the organic can emerge between simple chemical self-replication systems and extremophile life forms studied in astrobiology. So the scope from which artists can pick is extremely large. But Nina Cigledi and Ramin Guardians have mapped that artists make in general very poor use of this large scope that is opened up by media technologies and scientific tools. Most works are still concentrated in the small bubble of the mesoscopic scale of the organisms with, of course, the human reference point in the middle. However, the most different features, actions, and functions by which living entities can be characterized, such as largely listed here, just an, exa an example in Bernhard Rennisch's epistemology-based biophilosophy, could trigger artistic intervention at all of these scales. You can trigger, of course, metabolism, stability, psychic emergence. It's up to you by which uh, of these features you would like to characterize living. 
So within the epistemological turn, the emphasis artists selectively put on chosen characteristics serve as an indicator of both the philosophical and the techno-scientific contents within which uh, the degrees of agency confronted to otherness here appear and operate. And I have selected a very short 20 case studies of artists with whom I've curatorially worked with and to cover some of these aspects with regards to micro-performativity, molecular theater, plant amorphizations, and big bacteria. So in view of biotechnological methods that are now available for art, new prospects for staging co-corporality within the continuum of life emerge and extending the notion of agency beyond the range of human actions to the potentials of animal and plant life but also to the material media, experimental systems often screened out. And it is here that the potential of the notion of micro-performativity uh, is nested. I want to agree with Chris Salter that performativity itself needs to be understood as a technical cultural hybrid form. In his book, Entangled Technology and the Transformation of Performance, he shows that performative forms and the fascination of the machinic had gone hand in hand but that in the late 20th century, the long history of technological entanglements with performance practices has been ignored or downplayed, not only in theater and dance histories or post dramaturgy, but also in the recent search of writing about new media. Before the notion then, again, in the techno-scientific context itself, appears by shifting it from performance art or performance as object of inquiry to performativity as method of inquiry. And according to this analysis, four main developments became entangled, some of which we have already debated yesterday. So I'll just flick through them, these four points very briefly. So we know all that in linguistic speech actuary, John Austin popularized the idea that the performative expression, the utterance, does not just describe an action in language, but actually performs or activates something. In how to do things with words, Austin suggests that Non-descriptive language does not just represent statements, but is an inherent material practice in which the way we can change the course of an event in the world, create a new one, pointing to the pragmatic nature of language. Then, in the upcoming gender studies, a performative paradigm is pursued by cultural theorists such as <coughs> Judith Butler, examining the political notion of the materiality of the human body, and it's gendering that is not ontologically pre-given as a fixed essence in a fixed human subject, but instead performatively produced in and over time. Very known, of course, in her gender trouble, she interpolates multiple meanings of performativity and advocates the active creation of reality that cannot readily be assimilated into pre-existing categories. The third aspect, in parallel, the performative turn in anthropology and sociology, of course, mainly under the influence of anthropologist Victor Turner and theater director Richard Chechner, further transformed the previous concept of performance as the subject of research into the performance as a technique of self-reflection, as a method by which research would be conducted. So the performative as a concept allowed then, beyond strictly textual forms, for focusing on the tacit, non-verbal, embodied, imminent act of doing, particularly into ethnographic research from the knowing that to the knowing how. And as a consequence, maybe, in science and technology studies, the performative program is extended to the analysts and knowledge production in laboratories. It takes into account the role of technocultural hybrids, experimental systems, and the agency of non-human systems in what Bruno Latour calls the human and non-human collective, thus displaying humans as the sole producers of knowledge or expressors of agency and postulating networks of human and non-human animals, model organisms, bacterial plants, technical objects, resulting in a more general actor network theory or the concept of a parliament of things. So this implies that performativity is no longer confiscated in the human-centric tradition of speech theory or gender studies, with agency as well being defined beyond the human scope as simply to be the capacity of an actant to act in the world, the term underlines the performativity of the actants as such 
and as quoting Latour, as any entity that modifies other entities in a trial. So, art. The first example, Spit Party by Lucy Strecker and Klaus Spies, oscillates between microperformative and molecular theater, in that it makes audience members bodily react to their own genetic data. So first, the stage play reenacts commercial home genetic testing, also known as direct-to-consumer genetics, and drawing on so-called spit parties that, to which companies invite celebrities to promotional saliva-based DNA analysis. They introduce the theatrical figure of Anne Wojcicki, the co-founder of the company 23andMe. Anne, as a character, offers cocktails, distributes kits with which gene mutations in individual genomes can be screened to give consumer information about the probabilities of occurrence of diseases, while the company commercially benefits from the data. But after some minutes of conventional theater, the diegetic time is disrupted, the participants are shifted towards real-time action, invited to provide cells with their cotton steps, submit cell samples, and sign consent forms. Then the audience is invited also, once the data are analyzed, to interact with their individually produced, live produced genetic images by posing and shifting their body positions. So you have a kind of um, um, reacting, a kind of mimicry towards your data. In another series, they enact or reenact uh, uh, what they call molecular animals, getting hold of DNA, DNA samples from, let's say, Freud's dog. Um, Derrida's cat, or Joseph Boy's hair, to which uh, the artist had once taught the history of the images. But this is another story. So, these performances follow a dialectic that Eugen Thacker has described as typical for biomedia, a concept that revolves around the central question, what can a body do? A body, however, understood as independent of its scale, including especially cellular and molecular scales. So first, as a biological body, a biomolecular body, a species body, a patient body, but also a second as a body that is compiled through modes of information processing, modeling and data extraction, and in silico simulation. So this is what a body can do. In contrast to molecular theater, the relative velocity inscription device by Paul Van Nuys is a micro-performative apparatus without human theatrical action. This is an absurd live molecular experiment and departs from the concern that today racism may move from the mesoscopic level of our bodies to the molecular level. And therefore the artist has sampled genetic sequences known to be responsible for the expression of skin color from all members of his mixed race family of Jamaican descent. Then the sequences run an absurd race against each other on a gel electrophoresis tray in order to test their genetic fitness. So it's a race about race in which the body is being erased, says Paul Van Nuys, and the title refers both to the relative speed of the molecules through the gel and to the velocity of the family members, the relatives. Right? So the winner of each race, however, change depending upon the particular region of DNA that was used and does not depend at all of the person from which the samples were obtained. So the results of the race depend entirely of the size, not the function of the sequences from, taken from different loci because simply, fast, uh, simply smaller sequences, they, sm they travel uh, much faster than larger ones. So the experiment shifts the focus from the differences between the physical bodies to the mere DNA. And Van Nuys was, in fact, uh, he isolated the skin color DNA from blood samples from his family members after he got deeply disturbed by a lecture by James Watson. Uh, the discoverer of DNA, uh, the, the DNA double helix and principal investigator of the Human Genome Project, and Watson discussed an experiment in which a group of male students were injected with melanin, the substance expressed by an interplay of genes that is responsible for darker skin color. And Watson claimed that students become sexually aroused, that causally they developed erections. Continuing stereotypes that dark-skinned people had a higher libido. 
So Vanu saw in this the ultimate molecularization of racial stereotyping because perhaps it's not the black body that is deemed prone to promiscuity, but it's blackness itself rooted in microbiology. It is not surprising then that well-known body artists such as Orlong become interested in microperformativity as well, likewise to speak up against racism. Uh, Orlong's first project to uh, involve biotechnology and not medical surgery, for which she is most known, the Mantour de Alicain, is a multimedia installation involving live co-culturing of various cells from different species and different human ethnic origins, including those from the artist's own body. The process takes place in a bioreactor with diamond-shaped growth plants that lend it a rudimentary faciality to make it look human. So as the figures had, the bioreactor is filled with pinkish growth medium and hangs on the top of a multicolored perspex coat with integrated petri dishes ready to welcome freshly made co-cultures. And behind the apparatus, we have cell movies being projected. These diamond shapes are taken from Michel Serre's book, The Troubadour of Knowledge, Le Tiers Instruit, en français, in which the harlequin reflects different origins and the tattooed skin consists of multiple pigmentations, figuring as a metaphor of hybridity. Beside her own and animal cells, Olong chooses a salon of immortalized female fetal cells of black ethnicity, and they incarnate very ambiguously a colonial gesture to avail oneself of the other as raw material. Further on, Orlong uses the patterns of the Manteau de Alicain and time-lapse cell videos in an anti-racism video clip produced for French television as an homage to Deleuze and Gattari and their call for mixed unions, free marriage, barbaric wedding parties, quote, let's hybridize. This is a quite risky performance we did uh, with this French group in 2011, and uh, Dimitri Trost already had sh shown an, uh, an image from that. So instead of delegating microperformativity on external satellite body, as in Olong's work, French duo A Orienté Objet has undertaken molecular transspecies communication in an extreme medical and shamanic self experiment. Que le cheval vive en moi, may the horse live in me. Uh, to perform blood brotherhood across human-animal species boundaries. Artist Marion Lavalgente turned herself into a guinea pig, injecting herself over the course of several months with horse immunoglobulins, that are biochemical messages that control, for example, the glands and organs of the endocrine system, and thus developing a tolerance to these foreign animal bodies. And having built up her tolerance, she was able to be injecting with horse blood plasma containing the entire spectrum of foreign immunoglobulins without falling into an anaphylactic shock. The intention being that the horse immunoglobulins would bypass the human defense mechanisms of her own immune system, enter her bloodstream to bound with the proteins of her own body, and as a result have an effect on all major body functions. The real-time physiological performance was paralleled by the projection of a stop-motion animation showing the immunological process expected to happen precisely at this moment. And after the performance, Marion on stilts performed a communication ritual with a horse, transposing and superposing the micromolecular and the macrogestural communication with the animal otherness before her hybrid blood was extracted and freeze-dried. The risky undertaking alludes to the possibility of healing autoimmune disease uh, using foreign immunoglobulins as therapeutic boosters, but it also can, of course, seem to attribute to Bogdanov. The performance is conceived as a continuation of the centaur myth, the human-horse hybrid, which, as animal and human, symbolizes the antithesis of the rider, who, as a human, dominates the animal. Staying on a very much safer side, Eduardo Katz combines the notion of plant-human blood brotherhood through genetic microtransplantation in his work, The Natural History of the Enigma, which in multiple senses qualify for the notion of plantamorphization. With this plantimal, Katz wants to reflect on the contiguity of life of different species by combining human and plant DNA 
a genetically engineered flower is being produced, which is a molecular hybrid of himself and a petunia called Edunia. And in the new strain, the artist DNA produces a human protein, which is only produced directly in the red veins of the flower. So the molecular manipulation creates in Katz's works, the, as a metaphor, as a material metaphor, not a textual metaphor, not an image metaphor, the living image of human blood rushing through the veins of the flower. So the genetic sequence is isolated um, and sequenced from the artist's blood code that codes for uh, the immunoglobin light chain and is part of the immune system and hence responsible for the identification of foreign bodies. However, here it is precisely that which usually rejects the other and protects against foreign molecules that is being integrated into the other. So Katz wants to highlight homologies between human and plant genetic sequences in order to underline our shared heritage. It stands in the tradition of philosophical notions developed by Julien Offre de la Maitrie in his book L'homme plante, less known than L'homme machine, stating that principal parts of man and plants are the same. It's a very early anti-Cartesianist um, book. Katz plays with, history, with the history of artistic representations and chimerizations, grafts, fusions between plants and the human, including anthropomorphic landscapes, associations between anthropomorphic and botanical forms, like in Archimbalgo, up to 1916's actions attempting to abolish the borders between art and life. For example, here we see uh, Czech artist Petra Stambera in grafting from 1975, grafting in the manner of fruit farming, as he stated, a rose branch to his arm, inserting into his veins, adding chemical fertilizers, and suffering from blood poisoning. Um, German-Greek philosopher Nicole Karafilis reminds us that the conceptual shift has deep consequences when human organs and media such as blood are being plantomorphized because this semantic decontextualization towards the vegetative accentuates the phenomenon of growth and a capacity of an unproblematic assimilation of disparate organic entities, the rooting the Verwurzelung in different environments. So the notion of graft or transplantation has always had a positive connotation. It implies optimization. In agriculture, it means bigger or sweeter fruits. In surgery, the prosthetic replacement for something lost. Since the 1950s, the notion of transplantation also has been used to describe the transfer of core material into a cell uh, of a receiving environment or of an enucleated cell. And in the trendy new discipline of synthetic biology, American biologist and entrepreneur Craig Venter speaks of transplantations to describe his spectacular transfer of a fully synthetic minimal genome into the bacterium Mycoplasma capriculum, which becomes thereby activated and fully operational. To advertise his technical achievement, the metaphor of a microtransplantation is used. Simultaneously, it de-dramatizes an operation coined extreme genetic engineers by its critics. Likewise, animal DNA is microtransplanted in Yuntakita's artwork, Light Only Light, a living and ephemeral transgenic artwork of a light-emitting moss sculpture in the shape of the artist's own brain. A magnetic resonance scan of Takita's brain has been 3D printed and its surface covered with bioluminescent moss, employing a technique similar to biomarkers that are routinely used in science. Namely, the luciferase genetic sequence of the firefly has been transferred into this moss, and the firefly enzyme luciferase then is activated with luciferin solution to produce oxyluciferin and thereby release energy in the form of light. So, of course, the on light only lamp presents a transgenic as an ambiguous cognitive achievement of the human brain, allowing for the creation of plants with the ability to emit light in a way that usually only certain animal species can do. But humankind is also dependent on oxygen produced by plants. So, however, the brain shape of the work is reminiscent of the skull as a vanitas motif, so confusing the brain and the cranium. 
The notion of plant amorphization then reaches from the metaphoric appropriation in molecular biology to tendencies in contemporary philosophy to debate issues of otherness and the cultural construction of alterity no longer in animal studies, but instead in philosophical botany. For example, Matthew Hall's Plants as Persons discusses um, equivalent capacities of sentience on mentality to plants, and Daniel Kamowitz's What a Plant Knows uh, is debating senses such as sight, smell, touch, hearing, or proprious perception and memory in plants, enriching the best theory of so-called multi-species ethnography imagined by Eben Kirksby and Stefan Helmreich, gathering in multi-species salons, while Polish philosopher Monika Bakic speaks of our need for new zoontologies, microontologies, vegetal anti-metaphysics to reconsider traditionally understood species boundaries and re-examine the messy contact zone between somas in the framework of the reality of messy transspecies entanglements. So these entanglements comprise increasingly the use of and reference to bacterial asanas, which is my last point. One brilliant example again is from Paul Vonus here, latent figure protocol, in which he material produces so-called genetic fingerprints, but not from individual humans, but exclusively using bacterial plasmid DNA from the PET expression system, one of the most widely used experimental systems. And not without irony, Vanus mischievously uses these pets as actual molecular actors. They evoke domesticated animals. So the latent figure protocol is an artwork of applied STS in a certain sense. It transparently sets all technical and biological non-human agency in motion. Enzymes, plasmids, primers, agar, electricity, and Vanus directs these pets in a way that they seem to self-organize in recognizable motifs rather than forming the expected ab ab abstract bonding patterns. So the analytic lab method is used for synthesis here. Figurative images emerge from a known DNA sample instead of customary abstract bonding patterns from an unknown DNA. Vanus generates iconic images which are symbolically highly charged such as ID, 01, copyright symbol, the chicken and the egg. And the result is not an image of DNA, but rather DNA as image. The artist deconstructs the very notion of a DNA fingerprint, which precisely is not an imprint, but a trace from a body which has been manipulated through standard lab procedures. It doesn't need to come from a finger at all. It must just be bacterial plasmid DNA. So, in our Copenhagen-based Big Bacteria project, then bacteria are both matter and metaphors for post-anthropocentric self-understandings. Traditionally antagonized as invading animals, from Pasteur to Koch, bacteria are increasingly understood as collaborators. In Amsterdam, a bacterial zoo, Micropia, has been operated as part of the Royal Artist Zoo recently. And my last curated exhibition, SO3, dealt with three significant othernesses only displaying art related with viruses, bacteria, and bacterial plasmids. As today's science focuses on the benefits of bacteriophages, microbiome studies, or decontaminating bacteria. So we want to ask first which role models are ascribed to bacteria, between, on the one side, just workhorses and on the other side, complex functioning ecologies, which were mere breeding containers or actors, and also how bacteria-related aesthetics, knowledge production, and the construction of metaphors are intertwined. I don't want to go through all this list, but when examining what roles uh, bacteria met met metaphorically and material have played in the last 30 years of art, I found all these categories as symbolic proxies, as movie actors, as cleaners, as healers, destroyers, uh, indicators of evolution, of learning biosemiotic organisms, just carriers of genes, or whatever. So, interestingly, or the next exhibition our museum in Copenhagen is working on is just focusing on the cognitive consequences of microbiome uh, um, uh, alteration. And logically, then, the exhibition's title is Mind the Gut. 
In the early 60s, first decomposing bacteria were used, such as in Michael Badura's close biophysical sealed world, less for the sake of the bacteria themselves than to push for art that campaigns for processuality, to end the days, as he says, of the statuary classical sculpture. Then, this is also true for H. R. Schulz's large scale, in, uh, scale museum installation, Biokinetische Situationen, employing massive amounts of bacteria and fungi conceived as action art beyond the human centered happening that attacks the very notion of a persistent art object. Quite forgotten this work today. When in 1987, Peter Gavin Hoffmann captured microorganisms populating Vasily Kandinsky's painting Parti divers and cultured them in rectangular array of petri dishes, he aimed at shifting organic representation to biological intervention. While choosing Kandinsky as a protagonist of supposedly organic art, the cultivated micro microorganisms are meant to fulfill promises that the classical avant-garde has finally not delivered. Later, Martha de Menezes' deacon picks up Mondrian's quest for harmonic equilibrium, but employing on purpose red, blue, and yellow synthetic azure compound pigments uh, as they are banned in the European Union. And here, de Menezes lets Pseudomonas bacteria that are used in bioremediation to clean up polluted soils digest these industrial colors. So the bacteria deconstruct, decontaminate, and decompose the modernist agenda. In retrospect, this very known artwork by Eduardo Katz, Genesis, appears as a typical case for art that is centrally using bacteria, but without addressing them. First, Katz uh, focuses on a synthetic gene that is generated as a transcription from a sentence from Genesis in the Bible into DNA base pair sequences integrated into E. coli bacteria. The bacteria indicate their transgenic nature by expressing GFP, but they are just carriers of the dominant genetic narratives. But after a while, we can see that even seven years later, Katz has made bacteria the central agents in a series of light reactive biotopes that are technically constructed as Vinogradsky columns with soil bacteria and that produce specifically designed shapes and letters. Also, when in the 1980s, pioneer Joe Davis uses E. coli bacteria to insert extra biological textual or graphic information into the genome, for instance, the ancient rune as a fertility symbol, the bacteria's agency is not acknowledged. They are just breeding containers for the artist's messages. However, 25 years later, within the context of today's synthetic biology, Davis' bacterial radio uses variants of a gene from this orange marine puffball sponges to generate electric circles that are literally grown by engineered bacteria. Here, the artist takes synthetic biology's metaphors literally, but not uh, in, the, in the very sense it, it, he's ironically reversing its goal. Because instead of applying principles of electronic engineering to biology, he applies biological principles to electronic engineering and forces bacteria to grow a totally anachronistic, old fashioned radio. So this contracts with a very playful explorations of bacteria in synthetic biology, especially when students, artists, and tinkerers join for this iGEM competitions offered by the MIT, inventing and combining biobricks. Here we have a subversion of biobricks in Thür van Dalen's Pigeon d'Or, when he subverts engineered metaphors and instead generating biobricks to make pigeons shit soap. He has modified the metabolism of bacteria occurring in the gut of the pigeons with the help of biobricks, and one is lowering the pH level in the bacteria, and the other makes the bacteria express lipase. So they implant new functionalities in animals formerly known as flying rats. So in addition to splicing the synthetic genetic sequence into bacteria, Van Balen has tested how long it takes to replace existing bacteria in the pigeon's guts, and hence addressing today's research into what is called microbiome transplantation. So we have another epistemic indicator. When Kathy Hai aims at becoming David Bowie, she's not taking singing lessons, right? But attempts to get Bowie's fecal transplant as a supposedly most individual trait to replace her gut bacteria. 
Cicel Tola's portraits individual's microbial landscapes in individual cheeses that are crafted from cultures sampled from the skin of different persons. So since each human body and each cheese has a unique set of bacteria that metabolically shape a unique order, is this a new fingerprint? Maybe it is. Likewise, Sonia Bäumel makes microbial self-portraiture fingerprints via non-human life forms while growing her own skin microbes on full body size petri dishes. And Adam Brown, in the great work of the metal lover, extremophile bacteria are the protagonists. They are employed for their innate capacity to metabolize metals. Here, they produce gold and seemingly solving the alchemist riddle of the philosopher's stone when in a bioreactor with a reduced atmosphere, the bacteria produce particles of 24 karat gold that can then be harvested to create little nuggets. And extremophile play an important role in our understanding of the origins of life. Moreover, they can filter toxic metals out of industrial polluted soils. In the same way, Gilberto Esparza, an artist from Mexico, uh, builds hard, soft, and wet were hybrids. Plantas nomadas navigate through polluted water, driven by energy that bacteria in microbial fuel cells produce while cleaning the water and releasing oxygen. And in his plantas autophotosyntheticas, autochthonous bacteria in microbial fuel cells produce the energy necessary to power light sources for aquatic plants to conduct photosynthesis. And if these symbiotic ecosystems are said to express autonomous or intelligent behavior, the latter might not mean to mimic human cognition, but rather the system's decentralized intelligence to clean up humankind's mess in times of major ecological and atmospheric crisis. So bacteria have served as symbolic placeholders, they become manipulated tools, and then now they are rediscovered as innate technical features. So in our project, we study, of course, the material matter, the bacteria as epistemic objects, the bacteria as epistemic tools, and the bacteria as epistemic subjects, so to say. And to quote my colleague Slavko Kaczunko, these coreless single cell organisms today build core media and materials of art and science. They are, so to say, coreless cores. Conclusion. We may discuss in how far the demonstrated development towards microperform activity, these agencies and macroscopic transspecies ecologies have the potential for a post-anthropocentric worldview and whether this deconstruction of the central mesoscopic human-centered plane is even to be desired. And it comes as no surprise that in art and cultural history, especially conservative thinkers have always been fighting very vigorously any kind of loss of the center, atomization or molecularization. In Art in Crisis from 1948, Hans Sedelmeier argued precisely that the lost center as a human figure in the image of God is responsible for the disturbed relationship humankind has with spirituality, nature, time and itself. But even less conservative voices such as Adorno and Horkheimer in the Dialectic of Enlightenment criticize the degree of abstraction from the human center, initiated by the Enlightenment, stating that each human being has been endowed with a self of his own or her own, different from all others, so that it could all the more surely be made the same. Abstraction, the instrument of Enlightenment, stands in the same relationship to its object as fate, whose concept it eradicates as liquidation. So how to avoid the traps of decentering and post-anthropomorphizing without falling into the trap of very primitive biologisms. And maybe as a positive example, I want to finish with a quote by a Chilean biologist and philosopher, Humberto Maturana, that for me probably shows the way. In one statement he said, I'm part of the human carcinoma, which destroys the earth like a cellular cancer destroys the organism that allows it to live. Cancer is cell growth that propagates with total operational indifference or disregard of what is happening with the other cells of the organism. So are we human beings in our blind focus on continued population growth in operational difference or disregard of what is happening with the other creatures of the world. 
the cancer that destroys the earth. But further, however, cancer cells do not exist in language, they do not reflect, they cannot reflect on what is happening as a consequence of the continuous reproduction. We human beings indeed exist through language and we can reflect and by thinking can become aware of what is happening by our actions so we can act responsibly. So here I think that biologists are meant to be understood not in the sense of social Darwinism or else, but rather in the sense of responsibility and negotiation with otherness of times of major ecological and political crisis, anthropogenic crisis indeed, in times of primitive ethnic nationalism, totalitarian authority, the renewal backfall in proto-fascist societal models here and there, the overestimation of personified human leadership, and anthropogenic ecological catastrophes often resumed under the still well-sounding euphemism of the Anthropocene. So artist excursion here, I claim, into these messy transpecies entanglements may be as necessary as a prefix trans, as a necessary condition to negotiate with any kind of otherness. And I thank you very much for your interest.